Thank you very much. And as we've just heard, I'd like to add my thanks to the organizers of this event for inviting me here. I feel somewhat embarrassed uh, to be here among, in the presence of uh, people who really have dedicated their lives to the science of medicine. Um, I've seen a few patients over the years and dabbled a little bit in clinical research. So I felt obliged not so much to give my conflicts of interest, but actually to give you a health warning, which you can read, uh, which basically states that um, I take no responsibility for what I'm going to say over the next uh, few minutes. Um, what I'm, in the title of my talk, it refers to the microbiome revolution, which is a title taken directly from a very nice review, uh, very recently, from Martin Blazer, uh, where he talks about what has happened so very rapidly over a very short space of time in this field. However, I'm not sure that it is a revolution. I think it's more an evolution. And I'll tell you why I believe that, because actually, some of the background of this area has been around for a quite a long time. And I'll give you a few examples. And basically what I'm saying is that the idea that the microbiome existed and played a role in health and disease is not new. And I'll give you a few examples. Perhaps one of the one that we know the best, um, and some of us here will remember it, the others are too young, is hepatic encephalopathy. Because many, many years ago, in fact, over 60 years ago, it was shown quite clearly that hepatic coma resulted from the absorption of nitrogenous substances from the intestine. Around the same time, it was shown that there were abundant coliforms in the small intestine of cirrhotics. And then, of course, there was the definitive study which showed that antibiotics improved for systemic encephalopathy, which has become, of course, a fundamental part of the management of these patients. And indeed, over 80 years ago, in fact, now over 90 years ago, um, an altered gut microbiota was first noted in chronic liver disease. And since then, there have been many studies showing that one aspect of an abnormal microbiome, namely, namely small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, is common in liver disease. In general, but not completely, it correlates with severity. It's associated with minimal and overt encephalopathy. It increases the risk for bacterial peritonitis through translocation. And more recently, and something I'll get back to later, it has been linked to both alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is not new. Here's another example, um, which comes from somebody who will be very familiar to all of you, who actually is a fellow Irishman, Dennis Burkett, who spent most of his life actually working in Africa and did seminal and very, uh, in very difficult circumstances, did seminal observations on Burkitt lymphoma, which still carries his name, but also developed a major interest in the role of dietary fiber. In fact, this is his um, biography, where he's referred to as Fiber Man. And he uh, showed, through comparisons of prevalence in Africa, where there was a very high fiber diet at that time, and in Western Europe, where there was a very low fiber diet, and that the, the prevalence of diverticular disease varied considerably. And in subsequent studies, he went on to show that um, dietary fiber intake in the population was associated with changes in intestinal transit and also in stool weight. And of course, more recently, a whole host of studies have shown a very close correlation between stool consistency in the Bristol stool score and colon transit. And if you look back at this um, diagram that he drew many years ago, obviously way before PowerPoint and other aids that we now have, he invoked the role of the intestinal bacteria in um, actually very presciently uh, altering bile salt uh, conjugation and deconjugation and contributing to colon cancer. Another example, we all now know the story of Helicobacter pylori, but in fact, Bacteria had been identified in the stomach over a century ago. And there are, there's a list of references here which were compiled by Richard Hunt, which I borrowed from him, uh, illustrating the presence of normally of bacteria in the stomach in, in a variety of circumstances. And indeed, the example of Helicobacter pylori, which is familiar to all of us, should remind us of the complexity of the relationships that exist between our bacteria our immune system, and our biology. 
And very recently, there have been some very interesting uh, examples of how the host and the bacteria and bacteria interact. And this an example here is a very interesting study from based on observations in Colombia, where in two areas which were in terms of distance quite close together, one on the sea coast, the other in the mountains, but geographically quite different, uh, they found that there were very different rates of gastric cancer, even though the rates of Helicobacter pylori were identical. And basically what they found was an interaction between the genome of the bacterium and the genome of the individual. If they matched, you had a low incidence of gastric cancer. If they did not match, you had a very high incidence of gastric cancer. And others have gone on to show interactions not just between Helicobacter pylori and the host in gastric cancer, but how other pathogens like um, Epstein-Barr virus may accelerate this progression to gastric cancer. Furthermore, uh, other host factors such as iron deficiency uh, through changes in the um, integrity of the cell membrane and can promote the development of gastric cancer and gastritis in response to uh, Helicobacter pylori. I mentioned these examples to illustrate how complex these interactions are between the host and uh, the microbiome in disease. Well, if it isn't a revolution, it's certainly an explosion. And why has there been this explosion of interest in the mi microbiome? Well, the answer is largely technical. And it's the arrival of molecular methods which allow us to perform high-throughput sequencing, now to move on to metagenomics, metalomics, metabolomics, etc. And very importantly, coupled to this has been the development of informatics uh, related to the analysis of these incredibly large data sets. Indeed, if you're going to get involved in this area, it's just as important that you have an informatician who is skilled in this area as that you have a skilled microbiologist. And this is a, a very simple schema of the, the techniques which are widely used. Most of the techniques which you see in the literature are based on the amplification of 16 sRNA genes by PCR and then followed by various types of analysis uh, to define the constituents of a given sample. This is my extremely simplistic interpretation of the methods. High throughput sequencing basically allows you to know what's there. If you do metagenomics through an interrogation of the genome of the bacteria, you can predict what they could do, what their machinery is. Metabolomics and meta metatranscriptomics will actually allow you to see what they actually produce. This field is moving very rapidly, and I think we're now moving from a very descriptive phase using high throughput sequencing to the combination with other techniques which allow you to really predict what these bugs are doing. So a few minutes to talk about definitions. Strictly speaking, when we use the term microbiome, we, should, we are referring to the totality of microorganisms and their collective genetic material present in or on the human body or in another environment. For a gastroenterologist, of course, the organ, only organ that matters is the gut, so we're talking about the gut microbiome. Simply said, this is the microorganisms and their genomes. The microbiota refers simply to the microorganisms in a defined environment, the metagenome to the collection of genomes and genes, and the metabolome to the metabolic products. Now, you will find even among experts that the terms microbiome and microbiota are used interchangeably, and certainly I think I will be forgiven if I do this at, later on in the talk. What I now want to spend some time talking about is what influences the microbiota. And this has an, is an area that has been rapidly evolving. And as it evolves, we begin to see the limitations of some of the earlier studies that were done in this area. So what are the factors that influence the microbiome? Age, geography, diet, and then a number of exposures, of which I've limited just a few. But undoubtedly, there are many others which can affect the microbiota in health and in disease. Now, this is a study that I always like to refer to because I think it summarizes much of what we know about what influences the normal microbiota. Just to give you some background, this is a study that was done simultaneously in three very different populations. A group of Amerindians in the Amazon basin in Venezuela, a group of rural Africans in Malawi, and a number of individuals living in cities in the US, in other words, very urbanized population. And what they did was they looked at the numbers of bacteria, of, of individual bacterial species, 
referred to as OTUs, in these various populations across the entire lifespan, from time of birth until uh, later, in, much later in life, in fact, up to the, the 80s. And the first thing that you will, I'll draw your attention to is you'll see from birth, there's a rapid increase in the diversity of the bacterial flora. And in fact, in the lower part of the diagram, and I've here I've highlighted it, you see an expanded view of the first three years of life. And you can see an exponential increase in the numbers of bacteria from birth up until the age of about three. Then from there on, and I've highlighted this now in the diagram, the actual numbers of bacteria remain fairly stable. So you acquire your adult microbiome over the first three years of life, and you acquire this very rapidly. This is very important because it is likely that these early years in life are very critical, in fact, in the development of disease later in life, which may be related to the microbiome. It's an area where the microbiome may be very prey to influence and where significant changes may occur. Now, the last part of the study compared this diversity, in other words, and in, in general, diversity is good. The greater the number of different bacteria you have, the healthier you are. Unfortunately for people living in rural, uh, in, sorry, in urban US, their diversity was significantly lower than either the Amerindians or the rural Africans, probably largely reflective of the uh, differences in diet from a very high fiber plant-based diet in Venezuela and Malawi to a very refined uh, processed diet in the US. And my colleagues in Cork um, did a study in the elderly because one of the questions that we still have only partly answered is what happens to the microbiome later in life. There is a suspicion that you do get a fall off in diversity later in life and that this may be in some way deleterious for health. So led by uh, Paul O'Toole uh, and Magnus Clayson, uh, they did a study looking at the elderly and what they did was they looked at three groups of elderly individuals, healthy elderly individuals, elderly individuals who had some limitation of activity and perhaps were attending for some rehabilitation, and then a group of elderly individuals who were so ill that they actually were in, in long-stay um, wards. And what they found basically was that in these elderly individuals, a poor diet was associated with a low diversity in the microbiome, which was in turn associated with increased inflammatory markers and was a direct predictor of poor health. Now, obviously, the interactions here need to be worked out, but this was a very nice uh, demonstration of relationship between diet, inflammation, or so-called inflammaging, and poor health in the elderly individuals. This was a very nice study uh, using a model which is very widely used in this area, namely humanization of an animal model. So you get a germ-free animal, you humanize them by taking, basically taking a human flora from either a normal individual or a diseased individual, and you see what happens to them. And what they did here was they looked at the effect of dietary fiber. So they took a, a microbiome from humans who were fed either a high fiber diet or a low fiber diet, and then they saw what happened. And basically what they showed, again looking at the figure on the, on the right, is that very quickly with the switch in diet you got a dramatic change in the microbiome. But what was more interesting was that when they transferred this to further generations of animals over time, this effect actually persisted. So not only will diet produce a change in the short term, but that effect would actually become amplified over time and uh, over generations. Now, I, as uh, an Irishman and as a supporter of Irish rugby, I have to mention one particular study. Uh, this is the Irish team who were European champions in 2014. And we did a study where we wanted to look at the influence of diet and exercise in these elite athletes. And what we looked at were, um, first of all, the elite athletes, which was the Irish rugby team. And then we looked at uh, controls who were low BMI and um, another set of controls with a high BMI. And the reason we did this was that many of these rugby players, like American football players, actually have a high BMI, but are extremely fit, and most of their excess weight is actually in, in muscle. And you can see that's clearly illustrated here that their BMI was, was, uh, was high, uh, but their uh, body fat actually was extremely low, as low as those with the low BMI. And what we found interestingly, and in complete contrast to what has been observed in obese individuals with a high BMI due to fat, was that their micro microbial diversity was actually higher 
than either the lean individuals or the obese individuals. And that this, um, this is looking at uh, using principal component analysis. You can see here in black that the athletes are completely separate from either the normal, the low BMI group, which is shown in green, or the high BMI group, which is shown in red. And what was fascinating was that this difference was driven primarily by their protein intake, which of course was extremely high. There also was an effect of exercise. So the point I'm making here is that diet, whether fiber, whether protein, or other factors, is an extremely important modifier of the microbiome. Antibiotics. I'm not sure what it's like here, but for those of us in the US, we're in the midst of an incredible epidemic of C. difficile. Um, virtually, I won't say virtually, but many patients who are admitted to our hospital come in with one disease and they'll go out with two, one of which is C. difficile. Uh, it's an enormous problem. It's way more important than any of the other opportunistic infections, in my opinion. What we've learned in recent years is that your basic commensal microbiome is highly predictive of your risk of getting C. difficile. Now, this is a, from a beautiful review published very recently, uh, which summarizes these effects. But basically, uh, there are several factors which are related to your diet, to your immune response, uh, which are normally protective against C. diff. If any of these are defective, it may predispose you to C. difficile. One of the other observations that's been made recently in the US is that probably as many as 30% of cases of C. diff are now acquired in the community, not in the hospital. And here's another interloper, the PPI. This is a very nice study recently which looked at the effect of PPI in the microbiome. And basically what they showed uh, is that those who were on proton pump inhibitors had significant shifts in their microbiome, in particular increases in streptococcasia and enterococcasia, which are taxa that are associated with an increased risk for uh, clusters in difficile. They also showed, as you can see, that there was an increase in taxa which are associated with bacterial overgrowth, which has long been suspected as being a combination a complication of PPI use. This is another aspect of antibiotic use. This is one of many fascinating studies from Marty Blazer. Uh, here they looked at doses of antibiotics which you will not get in treatment. These are actually doses of antibiotics which are much lower and which you will acquire through the food cycle. Because as you know, in the US and other uh, countries, antibiotics are routinely fed to animals to fatten them. And low doses of these antibiotics are transferred to us through the food chain. And ultimately, we acquire some of these doses. And they mimicked in these experiments these very low doses of antibiotics and found, as you can see in the top curves, that while there was no influence in overall body weight, shown here, there was a dramatic increase in fat mass with all of the antibiotics and in the percentage of total body fat, as shown here, with no influence on mean mass. I can also tell you that the, these changes were associated with significant changes in the microbiome and significant changes in liver metabolism. Now, in health, what does the microbiome does? It prevents colonization by pathogens. It educates the immune system. It ha has a very significant metabolic role by, through caloric salvage, by producing short-chain fatty acids, arginine, glutamine, vitamin K, and folic acid. I think a real frontier for the future is its participation in drug metabolism. For example, activating fibrominocytosilic acid, which we've known about for years. And of course, it also deconjugates bile acids. And here's how the microbiome recognizes a commensal versus a pathogen. So here's a commensal organ organism, bifidobacterium which is sensed by these dendritic cells, these antigen-presenting cells. And instead of activating the NF-kappa B pathway, which leads to inflammation, instead it activates a regular cell pathway, which you can see here, uh, which is anti-inflammatory and is, leads to tolerance to the organism rather than to an inflammatory response. There's been a lot of excitement recently about the concept of the microbiota gut-brain axis, so I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this. Well, just to, uh, to move on from what I just spoke to you about um, the immune response, it has been shown very recently and summarized in this review uh, that among the uh, side effects, if you like, of this immunological response is an impact on the enteric nervous system. 
as you can see here, uh, through macrophages, the microbiota can signal to enteric neurons, to enteric glial cells, and in this way can even be involved in motility and in secretory and absorptive responses. Those of us who work in functional bowel disease know about the gut-brain axis and how it's two-way traffic. And this also is now bidirectional when we invoke the microbiome. So what's the evidence for this? Well, one of the first studies was this one, which looked at germ-free animals and showed that germ-free animals were more spontaneously active. they measured here in two different ways. That's interesting. But what was more, even more interesting was when they studied their brains, they could see that germ-free animals had significant morphological differences in their brain with all the brain expression of these very important neurotrophic factors. Later, some of my other colleagues in Cork, uh, working with John Bienestock and McMaster, showed that a single probiotic organism could alter the stress response. In this example, uh, corticosterone levels, which uh, measured the stress response, were significantly reduced by the administration of a probiotic organism. And more interestingly, this effect could be abolished by dagotomy. In this quite complex study, uh, the same group showed that uh, a, a germ-free animal had some of the social characteristics that you would associate with, actually with autism, favoring the empty chamber, avoiding novel, novel situations, less social investigation, and more repetitive self-grooming behavior, some of which could be reversed by colonization. There are very limited examples of these um, fa factors in man. This is one study from Emory Myers Group in Los Angeles, which showed that a probiotic yogurt could actually significantly affect or influence the response to rectal distension in human subjects. Now, there are many examples, and I've already mentioned some of them, where the role of the microbiota is well established, enteric infections, helicobacter pylori, antibiotic-associated diarrhea, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the liver disease that I mentioned, and biliary and pancreatic sepsis. There's an endless list of disorders where it's been postulated that the microbiota has been involved, from reflux to functional dyspepsia, diverticulitis, necrotizing enterocolitis, IBD, and irritable bowel syndrome. Now, I just want to mention a few of these. In regard to IBD, of course, the role of the microbiome was very elegantly demonstrated when the important role of the CART-15 NOD2 uh, mutation was recognized because this actually plays an important role in the way that you, bacteria are sensed and that bacterial responses are are mediated in particular inflammatory responses. This is from our own study in irritable bowel syndrome where um, when we looked at our irritable bowel population in comparison to controls, initially we saw a little difference with a large overlap between the two populations. And indeed, uh, this has been reproduced recently in this study which is about to come out in, in full form in gastroenterology. However, when we looked at these patients in more detail, we actually were able to isolate two different populations, one of which overlapped completely with controls, the other of which was completely separate. When we now looked at these, we could now separate these quite clearly, and when we looked at their relationship with clinical factors, we found a very interesting observation. Namely, that those individuals who had an, a microbiome which was exactly the same as controls were much more likely to have depression and anxiety, whereas those who are completely different were much more likely to have no psychological comorbidity. Moving on, there have been many other postulated associations, such as in liver disease, obesity and metabolic syndrome, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, and neurological disease. Uh, for a long time, we've had an interest in the role of the microbiome in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and this uh, very simplified diagram summarizes a lot of these observations. The basic idea here is that in patients with liver disease, you have impaired motility, which leads to stasis, which can lead to bacterial overgrowth. You also have other data which shows that there's an altered composition of the gut microbiota in the small intestine and colon in patients with liver disease. There are many studies demonstrating a changes in gut permeability in liver disease, and the idea being that this combination of an altered microbiome and an altered epithelium leads to increased translocation of bacteria or their products to the port of circulation, leads to an inflammatory response both locally within the liver and contributes to both non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and fatty liver disease. This has even actually been um, 
carried over into cardiovascular disease is a study from the Cleveland Clinic, which showed that the microbiome through its metabolism of uh, choline uh, produces metabolites such as trimethylamine and trimethylamine oxidase, which are highly associated with atherosclerosis. And this again brings us back to the diet microbiome link. So in some individuals, a high fat diet plus a certain microbiome leads to the production of these metabolites, which are atherogenic and promote heart disease. Finally, we get back to the nervous system. This is a, a fascinating uh, review from just published in Cell um, from uh, Sarkis Masmanian's group, which shows how the microbiome may be involved in neurological disease. GF and SPF refer to germ-free and normally colonized animals. So in, in uh, germ-free animals, you get impairment in the blood-brain barrier, you get impaired neurogenesis, you get changes in microglia, you get changes in myelination, in neuron survival, growth, and differentiation, all of which may be invoked in a variety of diseases. I just want to mention one, and this is a, a very recent paper from the same group, which shows that in an animal model, the gut microbiota regulate motor deficits and neuroinflammation. And basically what they're saying here is that if you have a, if you take the microbiome from patients with Parkinson's disease and put it in this model, you get enhanced motor dysfunction, which seems to be linked uh, through interactions with inflammation. Before I finish, I want to give a few caveats. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about translation into, into the clinical practice. A lot of these translations remain premature because a lot of the clinical studies, including some that I've been involved in myself, have limitations. They've been a single point in time rather than longitudinal, which makes it very difficult to differentiate between what is state and what is trait, or even to remove the influence of therapy. As I've emphasized over and over again, diet is a major modulator of the microbiome and has not been accounted for in many of these studies. Do we really know what is normal? There's such heterogeneity in bacterial populations between and within patient populations that I think we're still learning what is normal. And then sampling is an issue, as shown here. This is a study from Yudi uh, Ringel, which looked at the fecal and mucosal microbiome in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And as you can see in the top, in part A, when you looked at the fecal samples, they actually were quite similar. But when they looked at mucosal populations, you could now differentiate more clearly between the IBS and the control subjects. And this is another study which showed actually in more detail that this applies more to certain bacterial uh, phyla than others. Now, in terms of therapy, which I do not have time to speak about, there are a range of possibilities. Again, I hearken back to diet, and many diets actually may include prebiotics, antibiotics, probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, and of course, fecal mucosal microbiota transplantation. So in summary, I hope I've uh, convinced you that the microbiome is important in health and disease, that host microbiome interactions in man are complex and far from completely understood, but there's absolutely fascinating stuff out there. Diet is a major modulator of the microbiome, and we're only beginning to appreciate this. Associations with disease are tantalizing and are clearly suggested by animal models, but it remains to be shown that they're causal in man, and we still have a long way to go there. And of course, this whole field opens many possibilities for new therapeutics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.